Welcome to The Interop, the show that's all about understanding the decentralized economic networks that make up the interchain. Today, I'm with Pranay Mohan, who is CEO of Nomad. And um, yeah, thanks for coming on. I know it's early uh, in your neck of the woods. Uh, thanks for making the exception and, and coming on Interop um, uh, at, at a time that, <laughs> that's not ideal, but yeah. No worries. Uh, thanks for having me, Seb. And it's actually like it's almost 9 a.m., which is probably like a normal time for most people. But being a night owl, it's just hard for me to uh, get going super early. So backstory for the viewers is we're supposed to hop on earlier. And I was like, hold up, I got a slonk of coffee before I jump on. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and, uh, and like I, I sent you a message as I was waking up asking you, hey, can you come on earlier? Like you were going to bed and I was just like waking up having coffee. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so let's uh, let's get right into it. Um, you know, tell us tell me a bit about your background and uh, where you came from. So I, I, yeah, I think you were you were working at Cello before, and you've got um, some uh, some like you, you worked at IBM previously. And and uh, am I am I right? Yeah, that's right. Um, I think I've told the story a couple times um, on previous shows, but like a quick quick rundown of how I. Uh, got into this into this strange field we're all in is um, I'm, my background is actually as a chemical engineer. Um, I went to UT Austin in Texas. Texas being a big oil state kind of funnels a lot of people into petrochemicals and oil and gas. And so that was what I cut my teeth on. I, I worked in a refinery. And then in 2013, I was working at Frito-Lay as a research and development engineer. And my project was standardizing the thickness of a potato chip slice because the exciting the, work yeah yeah thrilling um basically like trying to save humanity one potato chip slice at a time um, yeah but like the context was there's this thing that happens in the slicer where if if the potato rotates while it's being sliced it gets feathered which means one end of the slice is thin and then the other end is fat so that's kind of an exaggeration oh, but it kind gross. of looks like a yeah, it looks like a triangle. And then the problem is when you when you throw that in the fryer, one side gets real burnt and then the other side gets like a soggy, doesn't fry well enough. And so mm. at the scale that Frito slices potatoes, this is a big problem because that's like millions of dollars of um, just revenue lost, right? And so yeah. uh, my job was to standardize each slice. And I was already... <laughs> I was already like, how, like, it's that arrested development thing. Like, you might be wondering how I, ended up yeah. it. right? Like, I was already feeling like, how, how am I doing this professionally? And don't get me wrong, I love the people there, but it was just, it, it, it was strange. Um, that was exactly when the Snowden leaks happened, um, I think in summer of 2013. Um, and that had a profound effect on me because the like juxtaposition of what I was doing with this, like, also quite young man that, basically had given up his life essentially to let the world know and whistleblow about digital rights. And that like the Delta between where I was and what this person was doing and what the liberties they were standing up for kind of, that was the driving force for me to say, okay, I can't just like stay in my lane. I have to think about what I can do here. Um, hmm. And so that, that cascaded a lot of things. Um, I switched into tech, like you mentioned, I worked at IBM for a little bit. Um, and then in 2016, joined Snapchat, was there for about two years, kind of found myself in the same boat as slicing potato chips, except now I was putting dog faces on people. It's like new job, same type of ennui. Um, it seems that often people, young people get funneled into doing these things that are lucrative, but maybe don't really speak to their heart or have, you know, meaningful impact on the world. And so yet again, found myself feeling like, what am I doing here? Um, took a sabbatical and then uh, fell into the crypto rabbit hole. Um, I had a good friend and mentor, Ed Roman, that was hosting a conference called Hack Summit. And there I met some really brilliant people in crypto. And I was just like, okay, this is the Rebel Alliance. These are the people, really smart people that are doing cool stuff. And so uh, jumped in head first, uh, worked at Mina for about a year, uh, worked at Cello for about two years, and then most recently uh, co-founded Nomad and uh, excited to get into the guts of interrupt now. Yeah, let's. Uh, that, that's, that's a great story, and I think like for a lot of people, it, I think a lot of people in the space have a similar story. I mean, I wasn't cutting potatoes, but uh, but <laughs> or or putting uh, you know putting 
dog dog faces on on people uh but 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 i i, I certainly sort of it resonates with me this this idea that you know at some point you you wake up and you realize like hey, is this thing that i'm doing uh, in my case um building responsive email newsletters uh, for e-commerce, uh, really, uh, really putting a dent in the world. So exactly. Um, There's this yeah. statement. I don't know who the quote uh, is attributed to, but uh, the greatest minds of my generation were spent building spam filters. Right. And so, <laughs> yeah. Kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, let's, let's get right into the, into the, the crux of this. I mean, um, you know, I, I, I think all of us are, uh, uh, at least, you know, the people who who I gravitate around in the in the, in the you know, cosmos ecosystem, and I think you know, we have a lot of overlap there, uh, are are really quite passionate about this thesis uh, of the interchain and of like application specific blockchains or domain specific blockchains. You know, I think the narrative is sort of shifting there, but uh, interoperate, uh, having the ability to interoperate and. Um, um, having this world of like multiple ecosystems interoperating. What's the biggest challenge for you like in, in, with this thesis, um, you know, perhaps uh, in, in, op in juxtaposition to the single chain thesis, um, which was once held, I think, quite strongly by Ethereum, is still quite strongly held by Bitcoin and, and other ecosystems like Solana, for instance? Yeah, that, I mean, I think that's a fantastic first question to jump into it because it begs the whole question, like, what exactly are we building here? Um, and I'm going to go with like a, an esoteric reference. There's this book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, and it talks about how you define things is often based on how you define the interface of it. So like when you say something is an engine, that's because you're drawing a box around it and saying, Okay, the engine does not include like the intake valve. I'm not, I'm not an auto, automotive engineer or anything, so all my metaphors here might be busted. But my point being that if we say this is the boundary, this is the chain, this is the execution environment, then that's what we're looking at. That's fundamentally the building block or construct that we begin with. And that's how this whole space started. It started out with an individual chain, Bitcoin blockchain, and then Ethereum, which was supposed to be the world computer and was just one execution environment, like secured by miners, wasn't really anything outside of it. But then people realized, okay, this, this one chain cannot handle the amount of demand for block space. The fundamental commodity that people care about here is block space, which is another way of saying people want the ability to have censorship resistant computers at their fingertips. They want to be able to say, I want to use this app and have nobody in the world be able to stop me. And the way to represent that is block space, right? Um, and so the demand for block space exceeded the supply that was available. So capital formation, VC money, everything flowed into funnel into funding these uh, really high quality layer one chains that that we all take for granted today. The Polygon, Solanas, uh, Polkadots, Avalanches of the world. They're all they all came up because people needed to use chains, and there wasn't enough. Um, block space in Ethereum itself to do so at a, at a good price point. Uh, but now we ended up at this place where because our initial interface was drawn around the chain, we have all of these separate chains. And I think like Cosmos was one of the few projects very early on that realized that this, this interface, this boundary that we drew was more a result of like, uh, like the technology being emergent rather than the right way of drawing the boundary. In fact, if we can standardize the connective tissue across these chains, we can draw the boundary around more of them, right? This was the concept around the interchain that like maybe people don't even need to know which blockchain they're interacting with because everything is connected so seamlessly that it all feels like one system that was designed uh, in concert. Um, but to, coming back to your question of what is the biggest problem getting to this vision, fundamentally the the problem is that the place, the chains and the ecosystems that have gained the most traction uh, are extremely heterogeneous. Uh, and what I mean by this is the Cosmoverse is, is, is fairly homogeneous in the sense that everybody builds using the Cosmos SDK. Everybody has IBC kind of as the standard protocol for interop that can be used. Everybody has this very efficient Go Lite client that functions well in the context of IBC. And so it's, it's like not as hard, the threshold for being able to communicate between these chains is not as high. 
Whereas if you look at the EVM world where there has been the most liquidity and developer adoption because of Solidity and EVM becoming the lingua franca, there is there are not standards. Every route, Ethereum to Avalanche has a different bridge. Ethereum to Polygon has a different bridge. Avalanche to Polygon has a bunch of third party bridges and they're all dealing with the fact that the assets are wrapped differently. And so you get this trade off between where does like, where do economies organically emerge um, and how do we effectively connect them without having like a more centralized planning uh, potential or ability there. So that's the key trade off in my opinion that is preventing us from get, getting to the, getting to paradise. Yeah, I, I think that the, the centralized planning aspect is one that's often, I think, overlooked in, with, with regards to the complexity of, of, um, of bridging different chains. And um, I think what's, what an interesting point you made is this idea of, of um, um, homogeneity in, within ecosystems and heterogeneity outside of, the, of those ecosystems as they relate to each other and the complexities in bridging those ecosystems. And it, it, it's all just attempts to create more block space. Uh, but we are confronted with, the, uh, with this idea that, well, with the reality, at least as technology currently exists today and the trade-offs that we're not willing to make is that um, in order to scale block space, um, you have to scale it horizontally if you want to maintain a, a high level of decentralization and and bridging is being able to interoperate assets between these ecosystems is so key to maintaining um, a, a high level of decentralization and like different ecosystems might have different ways of going about that and different ways to measure that but that is the that's really the thing that everyone is trying to achieve um and so I, 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 you know, I, I was I was sort of mentioning earlier how you know we have like application specific blockchains or domain specific blockchains. Um, I wonder if like my my thinking is sort of shifted recently around around this idea, where in the interchain we used to we used to talk a lot about application specific blockchains. I don't think that that narrative will continue to be so accurate. I think domain specific or ecosystem specific or community specific. Um, will be starts is starting to make more sense and so i wonder if if you look at if you look at the broad sort of blockchain ecosystem you know uh and I, I actually i've heard you talk about this on the crypto Cito podcast where you you talked about the evm solana and Pod polka dot ecosystems as being sort of the three uh main pillars um you you left out solana and i'm, I'm curious to know why uh you left out Solana in this context but do you see these as separate things semantically you know do you see these as, sep as separate things that are meant to be treated as three different ecosystems where the underlying chains themselves exist at a li different level of, of abstraction or should we be looking at the ecosystem from the perspective that all evm chains all cosmos layer ones all polka dot uh, uh whatever parachains exist on the same playing field and that bridging should um, should exist between all of these sort of equal playing field chains. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, should we look at these three ecosystems that connect to each other or should all the chains sort of be on the same playing field? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And it's a bit of a spoiler alert is like, that is what we're trying to do with Nomad. So I won't, I won't go into shill mode just yet, but like to your point, the reason I said like the EVM, Cosmos and Polkadot ecosystems are like the three big federations is precisely to your point, I think those are the ones that have unlocked um, horizontal scalability better than the other ecosystems. Solana's thesis is still vertical scalability, that you basically, you ignore the ability of people to run full nodes, you focus on the Nakamoto coefficient and getting a ton of validators securing the network and make it like super easy for developers to build blazing fast apps. That is a valid thesis. But that thesis does not include other Solana chains that can interoperate, right? It is a verticalized stack where it's, um, I think the Solana people have like composability X in their name because a lot, of, a lot of the idea there is you have synchronously composable applications rather than asynchronously composable ones via these like interoperability boundaries. And that's why I kind of excluded Solana as like one of the three major federations 
not a knock on Solana, but just a different thesis on how to build. But they definitely have a ton of money and a ton of developer traction as well. Um, I think it would be remiss to not mention the two others that I think are starting to emerge and potentially another one, um, uh, Celestia, Avalanche, and Polygon. So Celestia, I think, is one of the more interesting projects because it takes a very radical approach to kind of how blockchains are constructed. Um, and I'm meandering my way to your question, but um, the other two are like Avalanche subnets. And then Polygon has like Polygon Edge, which is another framework for building different um, app-specific chains. Uh, but to your point around whether these things are self-contained or whether all of them can be compared apples to apples, um, it really depends on the quality of uh, interfaces between them. If the interfaces are standardized, then it should become more apples to apples. And if the core primitive fundamentally is block space, then what we're trying to do is we need to, the developers will be the ones that decide. If it is very easy to build a, like whatever you want to call it, cross-chain, interchain, omni-chain app across Polygon, Cosmos, and Avalanche, and Celestia, and compose all of that block space in a way that feels seamless, then we will we will have arrived. But I think the reason it doesn't feel that way right now is because each of these clusters, as Celestia calls them, is idiosyncratic in its own ways. And this is a good thing because it's kind of like it's nation states, right? It's nation states that have decided, okay, we have a bunch of states or regions that have that are fundamentally full of people speaking the same language. They might disagree on little things or have domain specific differences. But this whole thing is a unit in which commerce is easier to do. But then as soon as you get out of the nation state, then the, the laws, the languages, the mores kind of change. And so while it's not impossible to do commerce, there's naturally a bit more friction because you have decided that the local values take precedence over the global values. And that is a very good thing. Like, like globalism has its benefits. It allows more uh, market activity to be unleashed. But the downside is it centralizes it. It centralizes failure yet again. If if the global system fails, then everything fails with it. And this reminds me of a lot of what Bucky talks about, which is local economies that compose from the ground up to create a more sustainable global system. Whereas if you try and build it top down globally, then the local folks don't have don't have a say in it, which I think is quite oppressive. Mm. I, I don't yeah. know if that answered your question. We started getting no, no. I, mean, like, I, I think I, I think this this vision of the space is like uh, it's pretty pretty accurate, and like I think you paint a pretty um, promising vision for the space. I mean, I, I love to get into some of the you know these philosophical uh, questions around crypto, and I think like we could spend the the whole hour talking about it. But I, I really want to get into some of the technical aspects here because I'm I've been trying to wrap my head around. Um, nomad, but also I think just bridging in general. And, and I, I hope that this will be one of many episodes that I do about bridging. Uh, uh I'd like to come to a, you know, come to be at a space, a place where I, I sort of fully understand all of the different bridging technologies that exist, how, um, how they work, what are the trade-offs. And so, um, so this is like, you know, my, my first step into that journey, um, so yeah, let, let's let's maybe just dive into to, to, you know, the, t the technical aspects. And uh, I think maybe a good place to start is to describe the architecture. Um, and the the Nomad documentation, I think, is is like it's, it's actually quite good. And you know, the, um, there's some like nice illustrations there that show the different components. Um, so I invite our listeners to go and check that out if you're more of a visual person. Um, but yeah, can you describe the the different architecture stakeholders and um, how they interact with each other? Totally. Um, I, I think it would, I imagine a lot of the folks watching or kind of tuned into the show are folks that are primarily in the Cosmoverse, Cosmonauts. Um, and so I think it might be helpful to start there by looking at IBC, if that's okay, and then move into kind of Nomad's um, uh, security model. Yeah, um, one of my questions was how does Nomad compare to IBC? So that's a great sweet. place to start. All right, <laughs> I'm front running the questions already. So, um, 
Yeah, I think, so uh, I've said this before, kind of a low-key IBC maxi, because I really like the idea of um, having trustless bridges and trustless interrupt between chains. Um, and IBC is a, um, is a system that you could call like a header relay or a light client construction, where the way it works is when you have uh, Cosmos Hub sending to Terra, Terra is actually running a light client of Cosmos Hub as a Go module in the Terra blockchain, right? And uh, th that way, when you get a message going from Hub to Terra, you can trustlessly verify that that, that state was updated in Cosmos Hub. And so you can then take some action on it in Terra. That's fundamentally all bridging is. You're saying, I did something here, and then you're sending that message that that something happened. And then you say, cool, I believe that that something happened. I'm going to do something else here. Um, yeah, and Seb, I saw that you pulled up the Nomad docs. Um, I think we can, it's it's a bit dense, so I will uh, give you the link. We can drop it in the show notes, um, but we can look at the pictures later if it would be useful. Um, of, of course, yeah. <laughs> so so uh, uh, coming back to IBC, the, the reason this is trustless is because when you run that light client, as long as the validators of the two chains are behaving honestly, then the state in that light client is something that you can trust, that you can then authenticate messages using a Merkle path against the, the state root in the light client. But the challenge with this design is, again, coming back to heterogeneity versus homogeneity. In a heterogeneous environment, it is very tough to deploy efficient light clients everywhere because the light clients are, are coupled with the consensus of the other chain. In order to be able to accept each block header, that the receiving chain needs to know something about the consensus of the sending chain. Um, and so it's very hard. It's not um, the technical term is this makes it less extensible, meaning it's harder to deploy across a variety of environments, which is why we haven't seen a ton of light client adoption across the EVM world. So in, in lieu of that being available, the, own, the kind of prevailing other model of cross-chain comms is uh, externally verified systems. The light client systems are what we call natively verified systems because they only require the native validator set of the two chains. But these externally verified systems, they say, OK, these validators and, and chains don't know how to speak to each other directly. I will be the broker of that communication. Um, yeah, and wormhole is one example of this. What are other other examples of, of bridges that work in this in this way? Yeah, so other examples include Axelar, um, the different uh, canonical bridges like the Avalanche Bridge or the Polygon POS Bridge, um, multi-chain Synapse. Uh, they all use some form of either validator bridge or MPC. Which fundamentally, the security model there is. We have to trust somebody in the external world to tell us that something happened on chain A. So what we will do is we will increase that number of people so there's less of a chance that those people do something bad, right? If I trust one person, far more likely that they'll, they'll do something bad than if I trust 100, you know? And then the validator bridge is often, uh, and then the other one, obviously, in the Cosmo, Cosmo versus the Gravity Bridge, right? Gravity Bridge has been kind of one of the flagship bridges talked about in uh, amongst cosmonauts for a while. But the validator bridges say, instead of it being a fixed set, we're going to use a blockchain, another blockchain, and be able to rotate the validator set. But fundamentally, the, the trust assumption here is that M of N actors will be honest, and therefore, I can trust the messages, trust the state that I'm authenticating my messages against on the receiving chain. What Nomad says is, Let's try something different from both of these. We accept that we can't get the perfect security of a light client construction because it's just not realistic to some degree to expect it to roll out quickly. And there's a market need now, which is why we're seeing all of these externally verified solutions. But we don't, we don't, we don't appreciate the security guarantee of those or um, maybe put another way, we think it can be done. We think we can offer a different trade-off. Um, and the key yeah. thing, and I mean the security guarantees. Uh, I think like the the amount of, of bridge hacks that we've seen in the last uh, ah. just in the last year uh, really is is a testament to the security guarantees being uh, perhaps um, underestimated by the by the users. 
Totally, totally. But I want to also say that like some of the teams that have dealt with the hacks are actually like quite strong teams and it's it's not a reflection of their caliber, but rather how No, of course nascent, not. Yeah. Yeah, how nascent the space is and um and so given how nascent it is, I think we have an opportunity to pioneer this new verification model, which essentially says instead of trusting M of N, what we will do is we will just have one one party, the updater that is able to apply a digital signature and attest to some state route on the sending chain being valid so that the destination chain can act on it. But instead of immediately being able to act on it, like settling that, that state route immediately, we wait some amount of time in the context of an Ethereum to XYZ chain corridor, that time is parameterized as 30 minutes. And in that 30 minutes, we open it up to a set of watchers that don't participate in the sending of messages, but are just responsible for maintaining liveness and saying, hey, I'm observing what's going on. If everything looks Gucci, then we're not gonna do anything. But as soon as I notice something funky, I will submit a fraud proof and prevent that message from being processed. Um, and right now the watchers are permissioned, uh, make no bones about it. Like if the current way Nomad is set up, the watchers are permissioned in the contracts and they have the ability to deterministically prove fraud on the home, but the replica or the receiving chain needs to trust the watchers to only say, hey, don't listen to these messages uh, because they're fraudulent uh, when, when fraud is actually happening. And so the current kind of trade-off of the setup is, of course, there's a mild latency for the fraud proofs. And then the second thing is it, sh it shifts the risk of like a safety failure into more of a liveness failure if you have like watchers that are being adversarial. And so part of the system is we're going to add mechanisms that like prevent against adversarial watchers. And that way you get closer to this idea of a one of N security model. As long as there is one honest watcher that is watching the system, maintaining liveness and able to confirm fraud proofs on chain, then the system will be protected. So the watcher, so there's like, there, there are, there's the on-chain components and that's the, the contracts that exist on the home chain and the replica chain. Right. Yes. Yeah. So on-chain okay. is uh, just the contracts. There's two sets of contracts in, in the context of the token bridge. The way Nomad is architected is there's a home contract which you can kind of think of as like an outbox. Basically what you're doing is you're saying, hey, these are all the mails that I want to dispatch to these recipient chains, right? And then mm. for each, for Ethereum, say we want to send to Polygon, Avalanche, and Osmosis, right? Each of those chains will have an Ethereum inbox so that like Polygon can say, ah, I got a message from Ethereum. I can, I will wait a little bit now to see if a watcher says anything is funky. And if they don't, now I can now I can take this message, open open the letter, and be able to do something with it, right? Okay. So 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 those are the on chain components. So you have the so this outbox and this inbox, and every chain that has say like a, a channel uh, that's able to exchange messages would have both of these contracts, as each chain needs to be able to put things in the outbox and the inbox. And then there are the washers are are off chain actors who are looking at the transactions that are happening in the contract and submitting fraud, fraud proofs um, if they think that there's fraudulent activity um, happening. What, what is the incentive mechanism for the watchers? And, um, and also, I, I mean, one question I, I'm just thinking of is the, the, um, the, this 30 minutes, does that imply a 30 minute uh, time to finality? Uh, in a sense, yes. Um, so the the so every cross chain, and I'll work back to the two questions around finality and the watcher incentives. Around finality, um, every uh, cross chain, every time you're leaving a security boundary of a chain and moving to another security boundary, you have asynchrony, uh, and that just means there's going to be some time before the expected action takes place. And in IBC, that asynchrony is a function of two things, the finality of each chain. So all Cosmos chains have instant finality thanks to the Tendermint consensus mechanism they use. So maybe you wait six seconds or something like that for the block to be confirmed. And then whatever interval the relayer is sending the messages, right? So the relayer intervals is the other component of the 
of the latency. In Nomad, you have both of these things. You have the finality of the underlying chain, the Nomad relayer, which is very, very similar to the IBC relayer. It's a trustless relayer. Uh, and then the dispute window, which is 30 minutes. So you can kind of think of it as whatever the finality of a um, IBC might be, plus an extra settlement delay in order for those fraud proofs to happen. So that that whole, those three things combined is the time to finality. Um, okay. And how does that translate in a, like, let, let's, I like to look at things from a user's perspective. Um, if, if you are executing a sort of cross-chain transaction um, and let's say like moving you know, like liquidity from uh, one contract to say another contract on, on a different chain. Um, um, I don't know what's like, what's a good example here. Maybe you've got some better ones than I do, but like, let's say you're moving your liquidity position uh, from Aave on the EVM over to Aave on Polygon or Avalanche. Um, mm -hmm. what, what, what would that look like for the user? And does it also limit uh, certain types of use cases where you need fast finality for transactions? That's a, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, coming to the liquidity use case right now, what, if you're in the context of, of the token bridge, people have largely deployed apps as discrete kind of, like Aave has gone and deployed Aave um, V1 or V2, I forget, V2, I believe, on different chains. And each Aave deployment is, is the same deployment. They're not connected to each other, but rather you use the token bridge to move assets between the chains. In the future, those Aave deployments will all know about each other. They will be natively connected as, I think uh, some teams have called this like omni-chain apps, right? So like whatever you want to call it, the apps won't really care what chain they live on. They'll live on all the chains. In terms of how you move liquidity, I think there are different architectures, but you could basically keep all of your liquidity potentially on one chain and then just have like virtualized pointers to where yield should happen or borrowing should happen on different chains. So um, I think that use case is very fascinating and um, maybe Alpha Leak we're working with some teams on exploring that. So uh, I think we'll, we'll see some cool stuff there. Um, to your point around, you had a second point around this topic, which is, I, I think I was asking about the incentivization for the the watchers and the other participants, so the updater, relayer, processor. Oh uh, yeah, but before that, I think we want to talk about does it preclude some use cases that like? Oh yeah, the, 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 yeah, yeah. So um, coming back to the nation state metaphor. Uh, I think this is kind of like um, international travel, right? Like, I, ideally, all the things you want to do are where you always live, right? You go to the grocery store in the city you live in. Sometimes you need to you need to go to the next neighboring state or region in order to see a family member. And even more rare, you will go uh, over an ocean to another country in order to maybe do business or go for a vacation. But that doesn't make up the bulk of your travel right? The bulk of your activity is happening locally. It's quite wasteful to fly from France to China to do your groceries, right? Why not just import your whatever, like you're trying to, whatever food or ingredients you're trying to get from China, just import it to France and go to your local grocery store, right? And so in that vein, when you do go travel to another nation, you want it to be safe. You care more about like the security rather than the speed of which you get there. If I gave you uh, two options, you can either take a 10 hour flight and get there 99.69% alive, right? <laughs> or safe, whatever you want, however you want to call it. Or I can shoot you out of a rocket and like you will get there, but sometimes 10% of the time there's, there's a failure case. I think most people would take the first one. And so that's how we're looking at this where a lot of the economic activity that will go across security boundaries will be extremely high value and care about security more than instantaneous settlement. I might be wrong. There might be a lot of use cases like gaming or NFTs that need like instant settlement, right? And in those cases, then you, you might be willing to bear that security risk if speed is something you care about. So I think that's more the market will tell us what will happen. But our thesis is that that latency will not matter because what you're trying to do is far more important than like 15 or 30 minutes. Hmm. 
What, what what's the like i'm trying to get a picture of like what the future of cross-chain apps looks like and i i haven't really gotten a good answer yet from anyone uh, maybe maybe you can help uh clear this up for me but you know it, it feels like at least now there's a certain amount of latency when one wants to move assets from one chain to another, or perhaps even uh, as these uh, technologies, as these bridging technologies become uh, more mature, being able to control assets um, between chains. So having an, like basically the cross chain accounts um, use case, but across these different e ecosystems. So being able to control an EVM contract from a Cosmos address or something like that. Um, but yeah, what what is that going to look like concretely? Um, will these latencies disappear with time as we make different tr make make trade offs with regards to security over uh, over latency and what kinds of applications can emerge here? Because it. Uh, I, 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 I tend to want to compare things to the internet and just the speed at which information travels through networks. And, um, and I, I tend to think that we'll arrive at a point where this will be the case also with crypto, but maybe we'll all have made these concessions that centralization perhaps is like a trade-off that, or decentralization is a trade-off that we're willing to make over speed and things like that. Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating question. If I told you I had the answer, you should kick me off the show right now because I don't. None of us do. And that's the really fun part about being on a frontier is we are all co-creating it in real time. Um, and so, but to your last point, I'm extremely bullish that the technology will always get better, right? Like technology is is fundamentally a result of a story that we tell ourselves. And as long as that story is an optimistic one, pun intended, uh, then technology will continue to get better and track according to the vision that we've set out. So I don't think that we'll have to sacrifice decentralization to improve the user experience. But I think we, the reason we are staking that ground around security right now is because at this stage of connectivity between the chains, where like routinely six figure or sorry not six figure nine figure hacks and exploits happen like we shouldn't be thinking about like sacrificing security in order to optimize the user experience because security is the ultimate user experience if people do not are not able to fundamentally know that their assets are secure that their value is secure this technology will not get past where it is where it's just like degens with high risk tolerance willing to ape right like that is not if that is the set of users that feel comfortable using these systems then we will not get to that future where we can then have enough market reach have enough kind of mind share enough buy-in from people across the world to be able to make those optimizations on technology so we need to start with security first and then get to all the other things but to your question about what what do interchain apps, cross-chain apps, what did they look like? Um, I tend to think of it less from like a novelty standpoint and more around how does the friction go away? Because to your metaphor about the internet, it kind of, the internet kind of emerged in a similar way where there was like these different intranets, like Berkeley had CalNet and uh, like the US government had ARPANET and there were a bunch of other nets that were all like little intranets across the US. Um, and then over time, they started blending together to create the internet um, that anybody can connect from anywhere and talk with anybody else that's living in not only in different part of the country, but different part of the world. But fundamentally, what they were doing did not change very much. Like in the early days of the internet, it was like some researcher or academic sending an email uh, to, to another academic or researcher, right? Saying, yo, or GM, right? It's, it's like that, that's, that's what they were doing. What we're doing now hasn't fundamentally changed, except some some fifteen year old is putting a dog filter on them on their face and then sending it to some other fifteen year old 
living in a random different country, right? And so the, the scale and the reach at which these things can be done and the fidelity at which they happen has like increased orders of magnitude. But the fundamental need of sending information, packets of information between two geographically distant entities, that's still exactly the same thing. And so what, what, what's going to happen is, or sorry, again, I'm going into prediction mode. What I think will happen is um, what we've done for information historically, we're doing for value now. And so really what we're getting at is how can we reduce the friction for people to do things, compose their value and engage with others that have value across the world without needing to spend an arm and a leg or wait forever. And that's, I think, the key breakthrough is that if we have all of this block space that is that is combined with standardized connective tissue that is secure and then becomes fast and becomes cheap, then people will be able to do some really cool things and manage their entire financial lives on the interchain, but also be able to interact with people they've never interacted with before. And with this wide like amount and supply of block space, maybe we get into things where like there'll be an increased financialization of normal aspects of life, right? Like if I see somebody, this is kind of a weird example, but if I see somebody with like a jacket that I like, uh, I can maybe make a bid for that jacket in real time from my phone because I can send them a message to their address and like have an offer there and be able to facilitate that transaction. Kind of strange, but you get my point, which is that yeah. when the friction of sending and receiving value gets like rock bottom, like goes to zero, then we're going to have all sorts of weird ways of constructing, of doing commerce. And that's not necessarily for the good, right? If we increasingly financialize everything, I think that takes us to a more kind of like soulless realm if we're not thoughtful about it. But that that's where we're trending. It's like, I can't make a prediction about like what Ave V9 will look like, but I can tell you that like, there will be some really crazy things when you can send value at lightning speeds from, from anywhere to anywhere. Yeah. And for anything, <laughs> for it's, anything, you know, exactly. it's, it's, you know, with crypto, like everything becomes liquid. Uh, at least everything that's digital becomes liquid. Um, yes. Yes. You know, first, exactly. first and foremost, like before anything else. And, and then, and, you know, things in real life can also um, start to gain that, that property. Um, uh, just before we go on, because uh, I, I also want to talk about the Nomad, the developer product, so the SDK and, and, and all, all those things. Can, can we just uh, um, come back to this idea, the, to this incentivization question? Um, how are the off-chain participants incentivized to um, to watch the home chain and submit prop fraud proofs and um, yeah, and who, who or what sets uh, the the cost of that incentivization or the, yeah, I, I think there's totally. a bond or something. Yeah. Yep. Um, do you want to pull up that picture again? Uh, the, um, the like black diagram with, ha with, that, with the agents? Yeah. So um, this is a really helpful diagram. Uh, this is in our docs and it, it shows the four agents in the system. Um, the four agents in like kind of order of operations are the updater, the relayer, the processor, and the watcher. And in normal operations, the updater is that one party that I was telling you all about where it's their job to apply their digital signature on the state route on the home. And then that way it can be accepted on a replica. The relayer is, uh, so the updater is a permissioned party in the smart contract because it's, you can kind of think of them as the sequencer. If you're familiar with optimistic rollups, there's like one sequencer. The updater is kind of like the sequencer for the cross-chain comms. The relayer, it, it can be any number of relayers because they're trustless, they don't have to be permissioned, but their job is to just take that signed state route, throw it over the wire and get it landed on whatever replica that they care about relaying to. The processor similarly can be anybody, right? It's the processor is just a name for the person that says, cool, we got a new up, we got a new updated state route that has been relayed to a replica. Now we got to take this Merkle path, the raw message and prove inclusion. That could even be the end user, but it's, it's another trustless role. And then the watcher is, is that role that we've talked about that in normal operations, 
ideally doesn't do anything. They just kind of like stand there. They're kind of like the referee. And most of the time, hopefully all the time, they don't have to call fouls. They're just like, okay, things are fine. But then if something does happen, they can blow their whistle and say, all right, we need to, we need to stop things for a minute and see what's going on. And so the question is, um, each of these parties needs to be incentivized in some way. And right now, there are no protocol incentives in Nomad. We launched about three months ago, and our first and foremost goal is safety, just making sure that that system can run in production uh, with high SLAs, um, high security, and make sure people can transfer value and build applications on top. But over time, what we're going to do is bake in protocol incentives, but also like allow users to be able to basically pay fees to each of these agents so that this becomes a sustainable model that's kind of the economy can support itself. But right now, I think most cross-chain systems are subsidizing it in one way or the other because we are in a state where most of it's a it's a land grab right now. Everybody is trying to basically capture market share. And so if you focus on a sustainable economy before there's market share, then everybody else who's like taking the VC money and paying for everything will get a head start and and basically like win, right? So I don't think any any um bridge system or interoperability system in this space has fully figured out incentives. So that's the first caveat. But particularly with regards to the watcher, I think the interesting thing with the watcher is um, this concept of the verifier's dilemma or, or this idea of like, if in the ideal world, there is no fraud, then how does the watcher get incentivized? Because the watcher's whole incentive is if there's fraud, they report that, they slash the updater, and they take their bond. But everybody else wants the updater to be honest. We want them to be the good guy. But the watcher kind of has an incentive for them to be the bad guy because that's how they get paid, right? So we have to create systems that even without slashing and collecting that bond, that watcher can get paid. And part of that is maybe there will be like the user drips a little bit of their cross-chain message fees, and that gets added to the watcher pot that they can cash out over time. Or you can basically um, have these like challenge games where you you pretend like there's fraud in order to incentivize the watcher to stay vigilant. Um, if there is and they report it accurately, they can get some cash out of it, right? And so these are things that the governance and the ecosystem and the community behind the protocol needs to decide at what extent do we want to incentivize the watcher and how can we do so in a way that's sustainable. But fundamentally, what we feel is that um, if there are N watchers, we want the amount of compute that each of these watchers has to do to be abysmally low and also kind of align incentives with application builders. So if you are building an application on Nomad, you can run your own watcher. And for you, spending 50 bucks a month on a, uh, Amazon AWS like EC2 instance to run a watcher is like peanuts compared to you building a successful app and having millions of dollars flow through your app. Like the $50 is a cost of doing business. So we think there's ways you can have soft incentive alignment, but also ensure that uh, a lot of people can run a watcher for cheap, such that the overhead of securing the system is way lower than requiring like hundreds of validators to be able to, to, to always actively sign messages and maintain state and maintain an entire blockchain. We really feel like the overhead comes from throwing a chain in the middle not necessarily expecting people to check for fraud. Yeah, the, the uh, okay, that, that makes sense. So I think that what I'm starting to, the picture I'm starting to drop here is that Nomad um, has the benefit of being simple. At least the design, the design feels very simple. Um, there are the, this attack vector that we see in bridges that act as uh, an a, liquid a liquidity intermediary between chains uh, doesn't exist. Um, the trust model is fairly base is very simple. How it, however, the the trade off is um, is the speed at which transactions finalize, and the reliance on on off-chain actors um, 
can, can they censor transactions? Can can the relayer uh, effectively take the system offline by not relaying transactions? It's the same as an IBC relayer, right? So like, mm. it's they can they can have a liveness failure if, if they're just even if they're they're being good, they can have an outage, and basically what will happen is that state root will not be sent across a chain because nobody's posting a transaction on the destination. But mm. anybody can pop up and say, cool, the updater signed the state route. Now we can relay it over. And so we imagine that this is a role that I think Cosmos ecosystem has like been kicking the tires on this as well, which is how do you have relayer incentives? Because right now, I think um, a lot of validators in the Cosmos ecosystem, they run a relayer out of like service to the ecosystem. And like yeah. that's I mean, that's one reason like I love Cosmos is that there is this very much like, you know, like this is going to grow the pot for everybody and we're willing to do this. But as a as if you if you like what we're doing, like, you know, uh, throw some more delegations at us. Right. And, and so that works for now while we're in the early innings of growing this thing. But if we do want it to be more like economically incentivized in a brass tax type of way even Cosmos will need to figure out how to do IBC relayer incentivization. And we're kind of in the same boat with our relayers. Mm, yeah, okay. I, I'd like to come to the, uh, yeah, focus on the product a little bit, because uh, there's there's an SDK and the documentation talks about this idea of cross-chain apps. Um, what kinds of things can we build using Nomad other than just a, like beyond bridging, because uh, there's there is a bridge now. There's the Nomad Bridge, which is the sort of canonical um, app that you guys have built. Um, what what else can we do with this? And what's the SDK? What what does the SDK uh, make possible? Yeah, uh, I'm super happy you asked this question because I think this is the this is the thing we're most excited about. Um, and yeah, like so everybody everybody has their own word for what like a cross chain app looks like like we call them zaps because it's like that xkcd comic like there are 13 standards and i disagree with all of them i have introduced the 14th right so we call them zaps we think zaps are fun to say so we want people to build zaps on uh different chains using the nomad sdk um fundamentally what the sdk offers is a very easy way to say hey in queue this message send this message to another chain and then once that message gets received do something with it that, that's like that is the like building block that we are offering and just making that making sure that that message passing channel is has high availability high security low cost and a really good developer experience that's kind of our focus um and i'm excited for this because frankly i think people are going to build some really cool things that uh like we're not even aware of um or we're not we can't even predict like one of the teams uh building on it is um uh, I don't know if it's out in the open, but uh, well, I won't say who it is, but somebody's building a like a cross chain uh, TWAP. So TWAP is the time weighted average price. Um, I think it's like a, it's a way to basically have an on chain Oracle. And the way it works is based on uh, Uniswap trades. You can kind of get a sense of price discovery on chain. You can see what is the rough like uh, trading price for an asset pair. And then you can, over time, smooth it out using the time-weighted average uh, and have that be an oracle for a price if you need like a rough oracle price that doesn't rely on an external oracle. Uh, but right now, that's all kind of localized on one chain. But what if you could take the TWAP on Ethereum and be able to move that TWAP over to different chains so that people could then be able to use that TWAP elsewhere to, as a building block? And so that's, that's something that one dev team is building on top of Nomad. Um, other things include like being able to like do cross margining, like cross chain margining, where you um, you you like escrow some assets and then you issue a loan on another chain, right? And so, really, I don't know what the full slew of things people will build are going to be, but the things that people have gravitated to on Nomad are like being able to bake in native interchain messaging into their protocol, and particularly teams that um, have have built uh, good protocols, secure protocols, they've been running for a while. They've had a tough time kind of evaluating how did they go cross chain. And when they find Nomad, they're kind of relieved because there's, there's finally like an offering that focuses more on security and really tells them like, look, these are the trade-offs. 
Uh, we have an SDK, play with it and see if this adds value to what you're offering the users. And once they start playing with it and, and start grokking the, the interfaces and the system, I think they get really excited about the possibilities of how can they bake this into the deepest protocol levels, right? Like things that are not just superficial, like moving assets quickly back and forth, but really how do you take advantage of the fact that you can now communicate with a drastically different region of the metaverse deeply at the protocol layer? Hmm. Okay. No, that's, that's, that clears it up for me. Oh, there's one thing I, I, I still don't quite understand though, is, um, let, let's, let's imagine, uh, you're, you know, like you've got a, a, um, a stable coin contract. Okay. Like let's say U USDC and you want to be able to use nomad to move USDC, uh, cross chain. Does what? What's the implication? Do, do you have to build um, any additional infrastructure on top of Nomad to be able to do that, or does Nomad uh, support that natively? Um, yeah, like what? 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 Uh, so when you when you send a message through Nomad, basically, what enables that token to be minted on another chain? Is that an, another contract that you're building with the SDK, or is that something that's native to Nomad? Yeah, yeah. I think this is um, this is a product of our positioning not being as crisp as it should be, frankly, um, because Nomad is both the like the message passing layer that we've been talking about, the agents, the SDK, but it's also the name of the token bridge. And the key mm. thing to separate is the token bridge is a zap. It is a very yeah. simple. It is the application that allows you to do that message passing between, or to move the tokens. Yeah. Exactly. So, like the iPhone is also the iPhone is the terminal on which you can use dog filters, but it's also there's also a phone app, right? And so, Nomad is the is the iPhone the platform, and Nomad Token Bridge is the phone app. And so, when you want to be able to use um, cross-chain assets, like bridge assets, you can compose that token bridge app with whatever app that you're building. And even cooler, um, earlier this week, uh, the Connects team announced their Amarok uh, network upgrade, which is their first upgrade, and it natively uses uh, Nomad message passing to rebalance liquidity for routers. Um, and we're, we're, like, we're friends with the Connects team, big fans of what they're doing. But that is also a Zap. And that why this is really cool for other people building Zaps is uh, while the Nomad channels have that latency that we've been discussing, and the token bridge also has to experience that latency because it's locking and minting assets on the other side, the Connext layer can be blazing fast. Because what it's doing is it's more of a liquidity network. You can sell assets on one side and buy it on the other side. So I not only anticipate people using the Nomad token bridge for like settlement layer bridging, locking and minting, I think they will also use Connext for instant liquidity. So when you want to move liquidity onto another chain into any representational asset, not just the Nomad asset, but whatever, the AnySwap asset or the seller asset, you can use um, Connext to be able to do that. So we see Connext as a like a key building block and like one of the flagship applications that uses Nomad. Okay, that, that clears it up. So there's there's Nomad, um, the message passing technology. The Nomad Bridge is an application that an application that allows people to move tokens from one chain to uh, to another, and as a cross chain um, application developer. So let's take like Ave as an example. Um, I can also use Nomad to build extra fu crushing functionality for my app by using the SDK and deploying um, those, deploying my my app effectively cross chain by uh, deploying the, the 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 Zap contract on the different EVM chains uh, that Nomad supports. Bingo! Uh, we're trying to hire developer relations folks. Uh, based on your description, Seb, I'm like, are you looking? Are you looking for open right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, no, but I mean, I've I've I've, I've done a lot of this kind of like uh, 
Yeah, you know, simplifying technology uh, in my career. <laughs> no, that uh, so, was yeah. that was a perfect. Uh, yeah. That's a perfect description, and that's exactly what we're building. Okay, so I, I you know, I was talking with, um, I was having a chat the other day with Adrian Brink, um, and he he said something which, like, I, I haven't had a chance to really dig into it yet, but you know, he said once we have, like, once Ethereum moves to proof of stake and we have instant finality and deterministic finality, then Ethereum can become EV, uh, IBC compatible and we no longer need bridging. Uh, I, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I believe that's that was the, like what, what he said. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'd like you to maybe expand on this and talk about the complexity of um, using IBC across the Cosmos ecosystem, but also across the EVM ecosystem. And is this possible? And I guess the broader question here is, is, is bridging technology uh, like Nomad and, and other bridging technology like Wormhole and, and these other types of designs um, a stepping stone or like sort of a patch um, to uh, take us over into like an, a, another era where we, we're not going to need those anymore and we're just going to be able to rely on very simple um, message relaying and, and cross-chain message verification? To some degree, I think so. Um, and maybe to first shed my interpretation or some color on my interpretation of what Adrian was saying, um, we're obviously playing a little bit of telephone here, but I like Adrian and Chris and Awa, I think, are like have been in this space for a while. Chris was, I think, one of their early designers and contributors to IBC. So they've seen this for a long time. And I think that's that's a very interesting point, which is that once Ethereum is able to support fast finality and you can build a efficient light client that can use the IBC protocol, because IBC fundamentally is just a, a set of standards, an interface uh, of um, header relay construction. And, and right now it's kind of limited to the set of chains that have that support the Go module um, and also use Tendermint. There's still some coupling with Tendermint, though once IBC can be extended to all uh, PBFT consensus mechanisms, which I think uh, ETH2 will be, uh, then they can talk to each other using a light client-based construction. But I think this overlooks two things, which is in the distant future, this is a beautiful reality, right? But in the near to medium term future, who is building those efficient Solidity light clients, right? We, we're, good, we're quite good friends with the Gnosis team. And I think Gnosis chain also has this vision of being able to support these trustless bridges once they kind of, um, Gnosis chain, which is formerly known as XDAI, moves to being more of um, following in the ETH2 model of having a beacon chain and all that. But it's going to take a lot of time. And who's going to put the investment into building out this efficient light client and adding support for the other consensus mechanisms. It took about four or five years for IBC to really come, come live for this one implementation. I think saying it's gonna happen soon is a bit of a stretch. And then the second big thing here is, what are the costs gonna look like, right? Like part of the challenge with maintaining these like client systems is you constantly have to keep the state fresh and somebody has to be paying those costs. For proof of work, it's obviously quite high and um, I think our team uh, has previously worked on TBTC and knows the like the real costs of maintaining uh, like client state. And so I think that won't be trivial either. So what it comes down to is like, will there be a need for other channels that make different trade-offs? If header relays and IBC are secure, fast and expensive, then will people want to use externally verified systems that are fast, cheap and insecure or will they want to use Nomad and optimistic systems, which are secure, cheap, and a little bit slower? So I think there, it really depends, as we were talking about earlier, about the use cases involved. Some people will, wa will want to fly uh, across uh, the ocean in first class. We think a lot of people will want to fly in economy or in kind of business class. And then we think some people want to be shot out of a shot out of a cannon, right? And so it's up to the developers what they want. But in, in, in one way, we kind of see Nomad as a scout for IBC because really what we fundamentally care about is ensuring that there are 
trust minimized channels that give developers a good interface to build really cool things to make these to make this technology relevant to normal users and end users across the world. If the best way to do that is IBC, then hell yeah, let's get it done. But in the meanwhile, we want to offer an alternative to multi six. Mm, yeah, I, mean, I think like that's the biggest uh, the biggest benefit here is alternative to multi sig. And um, yeah, I mean obviously like uh, a world where IBC or IBC like protocols uh, are able to move liquidity across. Uh, move, move, move assets and and control um, accounts between chains um, in these different universes, right? Like even across these different ecosystems um, would be ideal. Effectively, creating a sort of TCP/IP-like uh, protocol that spans the interchain. Um, I think that's what we're all hoping for. Uh, but I don't know. I think it's, I think it's going to be a lot rockier than just like one day, yeah. like oh yeah, everything's IBC and uh, yeah. Uh, like if we're losing six hundred million dollars uh, two weeks ago, then I think we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves to start talking about like fully snarked header relays. Like it will happen for sure, but it'll take some time. And in the meanwhile, the market need always outpaces the ability of the market to deliver a technology or a product. That's the nature of free markets is that the need manifests first and then people, uh, entrepreneurs, business folks are able to meet that need. And so what the need we're meeting is highly secure channels and interop that is available now. And that is not to kind of cap like create capture and prevent more trustless systems from emerging. It's to ensure that we retain a future where trustless systems are possible because I am more worried about a system that is trusted captures it and gets network effects and we're not able to get out of that uh, local maxima. And so we want to pave the way for a global maxima. And that's those are our values at Nomad. So I want to talk about the the bridge a little bit and um, and the the networks that it supports and so the future here. And I think a lot of, like a lot of people that I that I like I ask for questions on on Twitter and I think everyone's really excited about Nomad um, supporting Evmos. Um, so, what what does the bridge currently do now, and what is the plan for the future? Like, are we going to arrive on uh, Nomad one day and see like twenty different EVMs and be able to just move assets across all of these very seamlessly? And what's what's the plan here? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so we started off um, supporting a few chains. Yep, that's the Nomad GUI. Shout out to our uh, amazing product uh, t a team that has built this. Um, and right now we are on these three chains, Ethereum, Moonbeam, and Milkameda C1. Um, we're super excited about Evmos when it launches because um, we're going to be like the flagship bridge deployed there. And then we're also adding support rapidly for the other EVM chains that you mentioned. So Gnosis Chain, Avalanche, uh, Polygon, uh, BNB, the L2s, uh, Phantom, um, and then also excited, really excited about um, Neon. Neon is the EVM on Solana, and they will be launching soon as well. And so uh, exactly to your point, being able to support the like 20, 25, 30 EVMs that are all coming online. And then at the same time, use we recently closed our, our funding round and used the new capital that we have to be able to like... Congratulations, on by the way. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's... Uh, it was a slog, but we made it there. Um, but like, take that take that capital and be able to then write contracts targeting different VMs. So I'm really keen on on Cosmosm, obviously, uh, and then also like writing substrate pallets or like contracts natively targeting near. Um, and of course, we can go on Aurora in the meanwhile. But I think the really cool thing will be to have native integrations. Uh, but so, so we just, haven't talked about that. But uh, sorry to, to cut you off here. But no worries. If, but the yeah you. you Nomad will also support non EVM chains. So they will have integrations with Cosmosm, um, say like, a, I don't know, Agoric and like other smart contract uh, platforms and will work as seamlessly as if you were just moving between EVM chains. Yes. I mean, that's the goal. Uh, it would be sweet. kind of, yeah, yeah, it, it, will, it will be sweet. I'm pretty stoked for it. Um, 
but it would be hypocritical for me to say it'll take a while to engineer efficient like clients in other languages and then say oh yeah but then we will deploy smart contracts on every targeting every vm like fundamentally it is like it is hard to write good smart contracts that have good patterns and then get them audited and i think it's a it's a dual whammy of like everything we've written is in solidity right now we have rust uh, kind of competency and experience on the team, and we can start expanding it. But really, these languages and these VMs are idiosyncratic, and it's hard to get expertise in all of them. So we need to hire and get people on board that know them. And then the other big thing coming back to when we were talking about exploits is the uh, wormhole exploit was due to a smart contract bug that like even like an, an amazing team like Certus like missed it because it's just so hard to get everything right. And I think a function of that is, or that is a function of the fact that the other ecosystems really were, were, were touching on everything we talked about. Outside of the EVM ecosystem, the security standards, the best practices and, and auditing firms and the different ways you can ensure your contracts are, are, are bulletproof, those things have not matured as much as they have for, the, for Solidity. And so part of it is, do we feel comfortable, even if we are doing our damn best to engineer great contracts, to get something like written, audited, and shipped in production where it'll be just as good as Solidity. I don't mm -hmm. know yet, but like I think with teams like Confio around Cosmosm that are popping up, we're gonna we're gonna get there. But like we will also be tracking the maturity of each of these ecosystems. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, cool. Well, uh, I'm I'm. Yeah, really, really pleased with this conversation. And so where, where can folks go to learn more about Nomad? And uh, can can people start building on Nomad? Uh, where, where are the, where, what's the call to action here? Yes, yes. Um, so um, follow Nomad on Twitter. It's uh, the handle is Nomad XYZ trailing underscore. Um, and then we have a Discord as well. I think that's where most of the community is right now. Um, we're doing a big overhaul of our docs and our SDK to make sure that all of the interfaces are like super clean and easy for developers. So uh, if you're interested and have some ideas, uh, if you can answer Seb's question about like what's going to happen in the future, uh, please hop in our Discord and we're, we're, we're really eager to geek out with you and, and build some zaps and really bring the vision of the interchain future uh, sooner than later. Awesome. Well, thanks, Pranay. Thanks for uh, thanks for being uh, on the inner up and and uh, yeah, uh, one one I think the the, the first uh, bridge uh, protocol to come on the podcast. I like I I mean, there's so much out there to explore uh, in terms of bridging, and I think one of my goals would be to try to get as many uh, bridge protocols on um, to really get a. Um, a broad understanding of uh, all of the different technologies and trade-offs. So uh, thanks for, thanks for kicking this off. Yeah. And thanks for your time. And I think you're doing uh, a great service um, for the community and educating people on all these different protocols. And uh, this is a very competitive category, but I've been just flat out impressed with the quality of entrepreneurs and builders on the other bridge teams as well. So I'm excited for you to bring on Axlar and Wormhole because they're good folks and, and they'll have a lot of interesting things to share as well. Yeah, certainly. All right. Cool. Thanks. Thanks so much. See you, man.